Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here. Welcome to today's talk called Creative Resistance for the Win with Nadine Block and Juman Abujbara uh, from Beautiful Trouble. Our moderator tonight is Shaniqua McClendon. Today's program seems incredibly important and timely in what we are euphemistically all calling this political moment. We need all the tools and strategies we can get to ensure that the voices of the people are heard at all levels of government. So we're kicking off the new year with a renewed sense of urgency and a renewed call to action. And tonight is a taste of some ideas and ways to make your activism more effective. So the goal tonight is to learn about the core strategies and tactics that made the greatest social movements of the last century successful and compelling. We have two members of the organization Beautiful Trouble here tonight to showcase some of the most innovative tactics used in global struggles against autocracy and austerity. Nadine Block is an innovative artist, nonviolent action practitioner, political organizer, direct action trainer, puppetista, and the training director for Beautiful Trouble. She's a contributor to the books Beautiful Trouble, A Toolbox for a Revolution, and Beautiful Rising, Creative Resistance from the Global South, both of which we have for sale out in the lobby. And she's also the author of the book We Are Many, Reflections on Movement Strategy from Occupation to Liberation. And she's the author of a special report on education and training in nonviolent resistance, published by the U.S. Institutes of Peace in 2016. And she also writes a column on the blog, Waging Nonviolence, called The Arts of Protest. Our second speaker is Juman Abujbara. Sorry, Juman. Juman Abujbara. Juman is a social change campaigner and human rights defender who works with grassroots activists and social movements across the Arab world. She's also an editor of and contributor to the book Beautiful Rising, Creative Resistance from the Global South. So we're going to begin this program with a little experiment, and then we'll have a presentation by Nadine and uh, Juman. And then they'll sit down for a discussion and a Q&A moderated by Shaniqua McClendon, the pol political director for the Pod Save America podcast. So now please join me in welcoming Nadine Block and Juman Abushbara. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Nadine Block. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you for coming here uh, tonight. We're glad to be with you. I'm Juman. Well, just take a moment. I see people are a little spread out, but we wanted to hear from you first because at Beautiful Trouble, we're extremely uh, dedicated and enamored of interaction and uh, of basing the work that we do in lived experience and our our knowledge of the world. So um, it would be great if you can take a minute and think to yourself right now, and then I'll tell you what to do next. When you hear uh, creativity for the win or when you hear beautiful trouble, what does it mean to you? What comes up? Is it some kind of activism? Is it some historical example of something? Is it something that you participated in yourself? And uh, when you have that idea, it will take about 30 seconds or so to, to think about it. It's nothing too uh, elaborate or deep, right? Everybody's got something in mind, which helped encourage them to come here tonight. Then uh, meet somebody close to you. Turn around, meet your neighbor in some way, introduce yourself, say hello, and then share the idea that you had. What is beautiful trouble to you? Um, what, what comes to mind? And then we're going to hear a little bit from you to start off tonight's work. All right, so feel free to get up and get closer to someone, meet someone, and take a moment and share an idea about what beautiful trouble is. You can turn around, you can talk to somebody next to you. All right, take a minute. We encourage you. What is beautiful trouble to you? So go ahead, if you haven't given the other person a chance to answer the question, go ahead and let's hear the other idea in your group.
Great, so go ahead and finish up whatever your thought is about Beautiful Trouble, whatever you're sharing with your partner. And we would like to hear from you, some of you. If anybody would like to tell us what you've been talking about, what does Beautiful Trouble mean to you, if you have an example you want to share. So, hi everyone. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Anybody in the audience like to share a little vignette or something that you've been talking about? What does beautiful trouble mean to you? Anybody have an example or a story that you want to share quickly with us? We'll bring a mic to you. Don't be shy. Oh, look, way up there we have someone. Excellent. And who's going to be the second person so we know where to go to get our mic ready? Hello. Check, 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 Hi. one, two, sibilance. Um, my name is Michael. I recently moved here to Los Angeles. And uh, last year I did a 555 mile bike ride. And uh, Beautiful Trouble to me was doing this uh, very gruesome active activity. Uh, that, was the, that was actually uh, kind of the beauty of it on the PCH overlooking the ocean. And then uh, the trouble is, well, this was for the, uh, the life cycle, the, the AIDS foundation uh, that kills lives every year. Um, and so this was kind of a, a beautiful way to do something great for the community. I was with uh, 2,500 cyclists, and it was um, very lovely. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Michael. So the story about the AIDS ride. Have anybody in the audience done anything like a ride or a trek, a walk, uh, some kind of group mobile activity? Excellent. Yeah, that's a really great example. Thank you so much. And we have another person ready to share something. Hello. Oh, OK, cool. Um, my name is Remo. I'm a student at UCLA here. And at first, I mean, the reason why I want I wanted to come to this event, I guess, is because I was hoping that Beautiful Trouble sort of meant like a different way to subvert the order. But thinking about it a little bit more, I actually have an example from when I was back home with my friends. And one of my friends had recently discovered an abandoned office building. And we decided to explore it as curious teenagers. and inside on all the walls. Every single wall is covered in graffiti. And I think that would be kind of an interesting take on the idea of beautiful trouble, that these people are troublemakers, but they're creating something that's really worth looking at. Thank you. Yeah, really nice. Great idea. So we'll take it maybe another one or two, if anybody wants to share. We've got one right here. Who's the next one? Who, who will be our fourth person? We've got one down here, too. Great. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Turin, and I am a public school teacher, and we're on the eve of a strike. And there's a lot of trouble, and um, it doesn't uh, look like good trouble to me. Um, I've been a teacher for 31 years, and it never seems to change. So I, I'd like it to be more beautiful trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, how about, just as a general question for this group, how many people in this auditorium have ever participated in a strike with other people of any kind. Oh yeah, look, so there's some experience here. And I think building on that experience, there probably are ways that we can think about how to make it more beautiful and uh, how to work towards the world that we want. So that's great, thanks for bringing that in. Yeah, we have one more. <laughs> so um, the Prince of Saudi Arabia was coming to the United States and we knew that he was bombing kids in Yemen, which is really horrible and ugly. So we dressed up as princesses and went and protest wherever he was, saying there's nothing charming about this prince. Very nice, right? And how many people have done some kind of street, I would, I would call it street theater or costume resistance? Anybody in this audience done that? Yeah, excellent. Very much accessible to our work that we do. So I just, just wanted to, uh, anybody else burning to share something that they were thinking about? Well, we really thank you for stepping into this and sharing your stories and meeting some of the people who are here with you tonight. We are now gonna transition to a slideshow to tell you a little bit about what we mean when we say beautiful trouble and a little bit about our work um, in, the wor in the world or the universe of beautiful trouble. Great. Um, well, just to pick up on where things have uh, ended, 
um, the idea of Beautiful Trouble kind of came together after people who uh, have been involved in s similar inspiring stories like the four we heard here in this room or ideas, um, artists, activists who came together and decided to write this book. And at the beginning, the thought was it's going to be just this one book, but now we have a full suite of platforms that we're, oh, we're going to talk about later um, at the end of the slideshow. And um, yeah, so basically um, the main observation was that we noticed from whether our own involvements or uh, from in, uh, the involvements of those around us that uh, groups tend to generally jump into their tactics because that's the fun thing to do, it's great, we're angry, we want to do a demonstration, da da da. But really, why are we doing this? And these kind of questions that frame the broader strategy is kind of what Beautiful Trouble is about. And if you look at this um, uh, pyramid over here, uh, where are tactics uh, located? And they are, oh, I'm sorry, we, we seem to have lost um, the big screen behind us, but it's okay. So basically the idea is that you have the vision at the top <coughs> of the pyramid, right? And and that's, uh, the tactics is one of the ways that you can actually go um, uh, up that pyramid. And uh, without without a strategy, the tactic is just gonna be a tactic where it's not gonna be able to deliver on what we actually want. Um, and this is where the super uh, power, if you want, um, uh, the superpower of uh, beautiful trouble lies is in the analysis. And we discovered that we can take a story, pretty much like the ones we've heard tonight, and tease them out, kind of understand what tactics have been used, what principles have been used, and the theories and the methodologies that make up this story, and really identify tools and lessons that these movements or campaigns learned and also um, identify factors that led to their success. And to make this uh, less abstract, I think we're going to um, yeah, uh, hear some examples from each of these modules tonight and then hopefully discuss them in more details later with Shaniqua. Excellent. All right, so we're just gonna jump right in. Is that all right? Yeah, let's go. Here we go. So right away we have something, we have theories. When you talk about uh, activism and you get people to tell their stories about what they've done or what they've heard about, um, then you can actually take these stories apart and figure out what made them work or what made them miserable failures. So one thing that we've identified is action logic. And the essential element of action logic is that your action should be able to to tell the story almost in one picture. There should be a photo you can take that makes sense. And in this case, you look, there's two great examples here. Anybody recognize either one of them? What do you see? Anybody? Right, so um, the, bottom, the one on the bottom is Bree Newsom in South Carolina, a young black woman taking down the Confederate flag from in front of the state building in South Carolina. So it makes so, the, the picture of this tells the whole world. We've got the new world t order taking down an old, really oppressive re symbol of an oppressive regime. And the one at the top is something that happened just this, uh, just last week in India, where some of you might be aware that the Supreme Court in India ruled that women should have access to shrines even though his, historically, tr religious traditions have banned women of menstruating age from certain shrines. And women lined up in a more than a 600 kilometer line to support the women who visited the shrine. So the picture itself shows the power of ordinary people taking action. So that's one really basic example of a theory to consider when you're planning your creative work. Here's another really great one, one of my favorites. Making the invisible visible. One of the issues that we face as activists, one of the first things that we face is actually making the problem visible to people who don't understand what's happening. Here's three examples. One is an environmental example, one is a political example, and one is more of a cultural or an assumption, uh, a cultural assumption that we need to talk about. So you can see the outline of the Vitruvian Man right on an ice floe near the North Pole visibly making, a, making us aware of the costs of climate change, both in 
uh, to the environment and to our human community. The one on the bottom is making visible the political and human costs of an extractive banking industry that has made people homeless because of bad loans. This happens to be a picture of someone who was made homeless by this bank in Spain. So making it public, who is suffering at the hands of the banking industry. And of course, the one at the top, people recognize the Gorilla Girls acting with incredible humor to expose assumptions that women, and particularly women of color, do not have um, adequate representation in uh, traditional art galleries. And this uh, was a very effective campaign and increased the percentage of people, women particularly, who were shown in the galleries in New York um, in a pretty short period of time. So one of this is a really important principle for activists. Here's another one, using cultural assets. This is the idea that we often need to be very cognizant of what we can bring to the table. If you're a community that dances, you can use dance. If you're a community that uses food in a particular way, if you're a community that's language or other traditional rituals are important, use them in your work because it will make you more powerful and more coherent activists. This example here is in Estonia, the singing revolution. The culture of Estonia is based on communal singing and they use this to resist Soviet invasion. Kind of sounds amazing, doesn't it? it? It was amazing and it made them able to maintain their nonviolent discipline and to do actions together in extremely powerful ways. Really great, great movie out, The Singing Revolution. Here's another fabulous one to think about, a principle whereby we want to make sure that there's no good option for our opponent to take when we do something. And the small picture, everybody must recognize Gandhi on the salt march, the quintessential decision dilemma action. By marching to the sea, Gandhi made it impossible, basically, for the Brits to do something correct. If they let him march to the sea, then people knew about it, people joined him, and the movement grew, and they looked weak because they couldn't stop him. If they crushed this march to the sea, then they were exposing the vicious underbelly of the Raj. And that's exactly why they let them march, not knowing what to do. And that served their community really well, the, the Gandhian community. The one at the top is what we call an, uh, un, an involuntary walkathon. This happened in a part of Germany, Bavaria, where neo-fascists would march every year, and they couldn't get them to stop. And so what they did, the people who didn't want the neo-fascists there, was to make it a walkathon, and people pledged money for every meter that the neo-fascists walked. And that money went to fund Exit Deutschland, a community group that helped people leave the neo-fascist organizing. And so they raised 10,000, I forget, dollars or whatever it was in that one march that they had that one year. And they continued to do things like this. So it was a really fun day. They made it look like fun. That pink banner says, if only the Fuhrer knew what you were doing, right? raising money to uh, get people out of these fascist groups. So it was really, really very um, effective. And another thing, we talked a little bit about culture jamming, uh, using cultural assets. But culture jamming is taking popular culture and, and moving it to another place. And in particular, um, it could be also using the media. We call it media hacking. But uh, people recognize these costumes. The handmade costumes, right, from a book written um, in 1984, but now a TV show. And so a lot, another generation knows about the handmaids and the dystopic future that they lived in in the United States where a religious regime takes over um, the country and strips women of their rights. So these women were in, on Capitol Hill during the Kavanaugh hearings and made it very clear what was at stake and how we needed to be vigilant about what was, uh, not only what the hearing was about, which is the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice, but uh, what we needed to do on Capitol Hill to make sure that our Congress supported uh, women's right to choose. And I'm gonna turn it over. Um, yeah, so another tactic that uh, we'd like to highlight tonight is called clandestine leafleting. And the idea is that in, especially in oppressive regimes where uh, leafleting in itself can lead to uh, uh, arrest and even worse um, 
uh, actions by the state is that uh, to use to basically use different ways that you can avoid getting caught out caught. And one of the ideas, if you see the pictures with the uh, ping pong balls in Syria in the early days of the uprising, activists uh, wrote, wrote the word freedom on hundreds of ping pong balls and dropped them down a hill through the city of Damascus. And that way, no one could know who where the source of the, these ping pong balls were. Another idea was uh, activists in Palestine who wrote on the currency, the Israeli shekel, uh, f the word free Palestine. And the idea here is that, you know, uh, how can activists use the resources that are available to them and that can do service to their campaign or to their work and uh, employ it for their benefit? So currency is a very um, uh, smart idea of how resources or things that go around, everyone uses them. And um, yeah, so it, it's kind of good to reflect, maybe not all these examples work in every context, but it's good for campaigns to kind of think, okay, what in my context, what resources do I have to make that kind of um, access? Um, another tactic uh, we have is called prefigurative in intervention. Maybe that's a fancy name to call it, but it's basically what it means is how can we build the world that we want while we are in the process of demanding it or getting there. And um, if you see the picture here of people who are uh, having like a small picnic or park, basically um, they would uh, take, they would go to parking lots and turn them into parks. And uh, it happens on an, like an, an annual uh, day for action uh, to demand uh, or pre uh, prefigure basically greener spaces in the city. The other picture at the bottom is um, a picture of uh, people who were demanding uh, a daycare in their building, and that didn't happen after so many attempts. Uh, they, they just didn't uh, manage to, to actually get it done. So they brought their babies, they brought the diapers, they brought everything, and they just took the executive office, I think, and they turned it into a daycare. And that way they kind of... Um, made what they wanted materialize in a very real way. Um, methodologies, that's like the final um, or the fifth module in our toolkit. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk about the spectrum of allies, but it's one tool of many that movements can use to uh, advance their campaigns and to be more strategic and to really make the most out of them. And uh, probably some of you tonight have already used this tool which is shifting the spectrum of allies. And the idea is that usually in our campaigns, we tend to be focused on two things, either those who are fiercely oppose us or those who are vehement supporters of our cause. And it's this is a good tool to kind of take a step back and think, okay, what about the people along the spectrum? And the idea is that you wanna get those people close Sorry, closer to where you are. So if you have passive allies, you want to turn them into active allies. And if you have n people who are, n are neutral, you want to make them passive allies and passive opposition into neutral. So you really don't want to focus on the opposition, the fierce opposition, because they're not going to change their mind. right? And one of the campaigns that used this analysis was the uh, coalition of Immokalee workers uh, in the Taco Bell boycott. And they reached out into different to different groups. Um, they targeted or they built coalitions with students who, who Taco Bell targeted as consumers, and they got them involved in the campaign. Uh, ac uh, and they sh they tr um, got them basically actively involved, not just supporting. And also reached out to religious groups, to churches, to labor unions. Um, so yeah, um, and. This is basically a glimpse of what we have in the toolkit. And if you like it <laughs> and like the idea and the thought process behind it, uh, the good news is we have much more of that to offer. And uh, some of the platforms in which these uh, uh, modules um, can be helpful for your campaigns if you're looking to be more strategic or creative or you know, going for the win. Uh, there's two books that hundreds, literally hundreds of authors came together to write in different parts of the world. And these are Beautiful Trouble, Beautiful Rising, as Claudia mentioned, they're on sale tonight. Uh, also, so, uh, the modules in the books and more modules are available online. And you can access them on the online toolkit, beautifulrising.org. Um, we also try to find other ways to access people who have 
uh, especially more probably in the global south who have limited access to internet and this is why or or who have uh, a lot of censorship so we've used the chat bot that you can download on uh, telegram and kind of have a chat with this bot to kind of learn more about the about the tools uh, we have a fun card deck that you can use in your um, meetings to kind of make this thought process more fun and last but not least we have jam sessions and trainings uh, actually there's one happening uh, this weekend here in LA starting tomorrow for three days and the idea is to kind of pass on this these skills and tools and knowledge to as many people as we can and hopefully you can reach out to some of those people in the future uh, yeah, to help with campaigns. Thank you. Great. So that's that slide show overview part of our um, evening. And then we're now looking forward to taking questions and having a conversation. So now we're going to have a discussion with Nadine and Juman, moderated by Shaniqua McClendon. And then uh, they'll take questions. Shaniqua McClendon is the political director for Crooked Media, home to the popular podcast Pod Save America. At Crooked Media, McClendon led the creation of their midterm voter engagement program, Vote Save America. She's a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where she earned her master's in public policy. During her studies, she also worked at Facebook on their politics and government outreach team. Prior to graduate school, McClendon served in various capacities on Capitol Hill, starting off as an intern in the Obama administration, and then she was a staff assistant for Senator Kay Hagan and went on to serve as legislative director for Congresswoman Alma S. Adams. Given that her focus is on political and civic engagement to ensure that the best candidates become lawmakers who are equipped to improve our country, we thought she'd be a great person to ask our guest speakers about how creative activism can work in synergy with more traditional mainstream politics to build a more just world. So please join me in welcoming Shanique McClendon. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for joining us today. Um, and thank both of you for being here. Um, like, I've spent my whole career in politics, but after 2016, I saw a lot more people interested in, in getting involved and not just voting, but figuring out like what do we do in the meantime. Um, so I think this is a great conversation to kind of give people what they need, especially as we get toward a really big election in a couple of years. Um, so during the presentation, well, and Beautiful Trouble generally, um, is focused on the role that artists and creative activism plays in activism generally. Could you speak a little bit about why it's specifically important for artists to be involved in activism and for them to use creative activism as they engage in it? Do you want me to start? Um, so, uh, I mean, the role of art, artists in activism, I, I'm an artist, actually, and myself, so there's a couple of pieces, though, that I think are really critical. Uh, in our world, for whatever reason, artists are often the holders or the presenters of vision. So I mean, that's one really big piece of it. So we have, whether you're a right, if you, I often don't use, the, I should back up even, I often don't use the word artist, just I talk about being a cultural worker. Um, because when we say artists, mostly people think about writing, drawing, dancing, you know, classical arts. And I think more about, and I, we even mentioned in the slideshow a little bit about making sure that you know your cultural terrain, making sure that you understand where your, where your base is and what you bring to the table. So uh, on the bigger picture, we often find artists or creatives or cultural workers holding vision for where we could be, how we could be a better society, how we bring our community to a new place. We also often look to artists and cultural workers to help us define who we are. I mean, even you know, developing logos and coming out with memes and things like that, it's important for those of us who are building community who are building movement, who are building organizations to be able to identify ourselves and each other, and artists can really help with that. And um, I mean, there, and there's many other reasons. Like it makes it more fun, it makes it more interesting. People want to come to a dance or a party, and they don't necessarily want to come to a lecture or you know whatever. There's a lot of things people don't want to do, but there's a way to if you can bring your foods into it, if you can have music, it really. Uh, helps build people and inspire them to continue to work. And that is another thing, too. I mean, it, for the long haul, it really is helpful. And I'll add one more thing. 
you know, this art, the traditional arts can also be a way that you can fund your movement. Um, and you can do things like there's not um, there's a great story about resistance in Chile and the women who sewed arpieras, which are these little uh, tapestries that were sewn to document what was happening in Chile, number one. But number two, they could get them out of the country to tell people the stories of what were happening. And number three, they could sell them and actually make money to feed their families during this work. So it's sort of a beautiful way to talk about the whole of spectrum of how art can be, art and culture work can be involved. Just a quick follow-up on that. For someone who's watching or maybe here today who's not um, a culture worker or cultural worker, how can they take, um, what can they take away from the tools that you've presented today uh, to be effective in their activism? Um, yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot of tools out there t uh, in the toolkit to kind of help with uh, making it more creative, but I guess, uh, some of the ones that I really like is um, one of the principles is don't dress like a protester. And this uh, coming from, you know, a hardcore kind of activist political background, is kind of, you stop at such a principle and you think to yourself, oh, you know, that's, uh, that's true. Perhaps in a certain setting, I might want to dress in a different way to grab a, a different audience's attention and, um, you know, speak, uh, speak to something that they could relate to. And this is very true also for art because art, when artists and activists kind of come together on a particular issue, issue um, s they can reach to a wider audience. Some people um, are more influenced by uh, big names, pop stars, act, uh, actors, if, and if we can get uh, some of these people involved or at least to be vocal about one's campaigns, that would be really helpful to kind of attract the attention of the audience that you don't, that is not hearing, um, that is not hearing what you say. And, and speaking of audience, another principle that is really useful is um, speak to the audience that's not there. Sometimes we think of the space that's around us and we think it's the center of the world, but it's not. So how can we really make our actions speak broader and beyond the physical space that, that we're in? Yeah. Um, and either of you can answer this, but Juman, during the presentation, you talked about people kind of running into tactics and not thinking about a vision or a mission before they jump into their activism. And there are, I, I think you could look at Brett Kavanaugh. We didn't know Dr. Christine Ford Blasey was going to come out um, with her story and even Trump being elected. We, no one knew he was gonna be elected. So when things happen and you just kind of have to activate very quickly, what are things that you can do beforehand to just kind of anticipate those or can you anticipate those and um, just, just so that you can fill in those gaps that you talked about? Yeah, for sure. I guess um, one of the first things is to ask, well, it, it's basically one sentence. It's a theory of change, but to kind of ask yourself a, a key question. What are the um, keys that are going to open this particular door mm -hmm. for me to go through? And uh, based on this theory that you might come up with, if you say, for example, my theory is that if... Uh, more people show their um, public, let's say, rejection of X policy or legislation, then we could mobilize enough to kind of confront it and shut it down. And uh, the, some of these things can definitely be anticipated. And if you're anticipating something, uh, let's say we're talking about a particular policy, and you're anticipating that it's going to go ahead nonetheless, then you can also anticipate that there's going to be a uh, widespread anger, at least amongst a, a group of people, and this is actually a theory also in our toolkit, it's called al-faz'a, it, it originated, or the word originated from the Arab world, but I guess it's a phenomenon that's all over, and it means a surge of solidarity. People, when something happens and they're outraged, they're just gonna go out there, but they're not gonna be out there on the streets all the time. They're going to be there for the first phase and then it's going to subside, right? And we know this. We know it happens every single time. So we can anticipate, for example, how can we mobilize and capitalize on this phenomenon for that period of time to make the most of it? I don't know, Nadine, if you'd like to yeah, add anything to that. 
Uh, yeah, I, well, I thought I would yeah. originally. Now I don't. But I think, um, I mean, some answers for me are how do you get ready for these moments? And there's this theory about, um, you know, activism is is an organization building, and that's all you need to do is build your organizations. And then there's this theory of what do you do in the moment of the whirlwind and the moment of like big uprisings? How do you manage this? And it's really a uh, merging of the two that's really important, right? The understanding that you have to build community and you have to prepare to be ready for when the opening happens. And so that's one of the reasons why Beautiful Trouble exists as uh, with an emphasis on training and preparation. And so I still think that's like a critical piece, um, building your skills up, building the community up, building your ability to communicate um, and understanding uh, strategic thinking. Uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be a huge process. Uh, it can be, but it should be a process of some kind, identifying where you want to go and how you might help yourself get there. And building on that a bit, so let's say, you know, a specific incident happens, you rush into the streets, you start, um, you start your social movement. Could you also kind of layer that on um, to the importance of working with the other entities that help bring about change when we want change that we don't necessarily control, like the media and lawmakers and, and how activists can work with them in, in creative ways um, to get their attention because there's a lot of things pulling for the media and lawmakers' attention. Uh, and of course, you want to get your message through to them. Um, well, I mean, as <laughs> taking a bigger view of okay. it all, there is... Um, an academic, there's some academic thinking about all of this. But basically, from a, an ordinary person, uh, you, what you want to do is go from a place where people don't know much about the problem, and there's great injustice, maybe a massive power imbalance, to a place where you've made people aware of the problem, you've uh, mobilized on this spectrum of allies and opponents people to help you along, and then you want to be able to build your power, you want to be able to leverage power, and we're committed to nonviolent action, which to us means uh, it's a strategic choice to build the numbers of people so that you can make change with people rather than resorting to violence. And when you get to that point, uh, along the way, you're going to use the media, you're going to hopefully work to a point where you can actually, if needed, to solve the problem, legislate change. And the only way to do that or to get to a mediation table and actually be able to help direct an outcome is by leveraging power that you build with your with community. And one of the things that we find actually um, is that there's a lot of disparaging of people who are formal lawmakers or formal mediators, you know, at a certain table, to the people who are in the streets who are doing activities and making noise and shutting things down and creating what pe some people consider is the problem. But in fact, people in the street are just exposing the problem that already exists, the inequities, the oppressions in the system. And what they do, what people in the streets are doing, activists are doing, is leveraging to build people power so that you can get to a place where you can regulate or mediate. Um, and the thing is, the people in the street, myself included, are often disparaging to those people who are at formal tables or lawmakers. And what we're thinking about is it's actually a, maybe it's a, it's a general movement. It might be more, con uh, not a line, it's never a straight line, right? But you want to build power and build awareness to the point where you can be powerful at a table that actually institutionalizes change, if you will, that makes the changes that can um, bring us to the world that we want to live in. And um, if people are interested, uh, it's called Adam Curl is the name of the guy who thought about this a long time ago. He's a Quaker. And um, it's called the Curl Diagram for those people who are interested in academic analysis. But from just a gut level reaction to how do we build change, we need to use everything in our toolboxes. And the trick is to know when to do which things, when to do which, which strategies, and when to do which tactics to support those strategies. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd also like to add uh, something to what Nadine was saying is uh, often when you're trying to disrupt or change the status quo and trying to really um, balance or overcome this power that is held at the top, there this power is not existing in vacuum. There's a dozen of institutions that actually uphold this power and these institutions are the pillars of support for this power. And 
um, if you, media is one of them, military or the military institution is one of them, the legislative institution is one of them, and if you can start um, kind of deconstructing this these pillars and getting some of them uh, on your side, or at least not actively supporting the status quo, then you have done already a good job in trying to kind of uh, address this power imbalance. And we, see, we saw this, for example, happening uh, in the Arab world, in the Arab uh, uprising, especially in Egypt. Things, of course, shifted in a dramatically horrible um, situation after. But at some point when the streets were demanding for Hosni Mubarak to step down, uh, they managed to get the military n not on the side of Hosni Mubarak and therefore having to step down without that support. But then now we see what the military regime is up to in Egypt, which is really horrible. Well, this, this is, maybe we'll go a little further with this one, because we have this tool in our toolbox. It's called the Pillars of Power or the Pillars of Support. And um, many people draw it just as a little building with pillars and try to figure out what's holding up the regime, which goes at the top, at the roof. But the interesting piece for me is that, first of all, you don't want to drive the pillars in towards the roof, in towards the building. What you want to do is pull the pillars away. If you drive them in towards the building, the roof will sort of come down, but it won't actually fall all the way down. So it's a visualization of what we're trying to do. And the thing is, the pillars, if you think about it three-dimensionally, they're also made up of us. They're made up of people. And it allows us to understand how we get inside those pillars, the institutions that are holding up the regime or the problem we're trying to change. And we'll know that the outside ring is made up of masses of people. If you were talking about um, the military, then you know it's the ordinary soldiers that are the outside ring. And as you move closer to the center, you get higher and higher levels of control. So the inside would be the general or whoever, the chief of command, right? And if you are looking at media t or you're looking at um, the legislative bodies or you're looking at schools, uh, again, the power is inside that pillar, but we have access to that power by analyzing who the circles are around it. And so it's, it's a combination. And it's a perfect, the Egyptian example is a perfect example of what happened when the street activists refused to go to the table to negotiate, thinking that it wouldn't be productive. In that vacuum, we saw people step in that undid all of the gains of the street protesters. And um, I actually have talked to some of the people who were the street activists who would not make that mistake again but they didn't have that understanding of what was going on in the moment. Um, so it's really, really a fascinating way to think about protests. Um, okay, well, just to tag on to what you just said about not making that mistake again, could you talk a little bit about why it's important after you engage in maybe a spontaneous form um, of action to then sit back and go back and reflect on whatever steps you took to see, you know, was this impactful? Should we do it differently next time? Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, I, I guess one of the m key and most instrumental practices, I guess, that uh, we have learned from this uh, reflective yeah. to uh, toolbox is that uh, no matter what the outcome of your campaign is, uh, reflection is a crucial part to kind of really have the time to step back, to look at what you've done wrong, what you've done right, why did it work, what were the circumstances surrounding it? And if you were to kind of um, generalize some kind of learnings or tips that you would give, give to a future generation or to someone who was doing a similar campaign in another context, what would these lessons be? And uh, I, I, I guess if movements and campaigns don't actually engage in this practice, um, they're gonna end up being stuck in their own heads and and kind of not being critical enough of what it actually takes to uh, to make that change o on the one hand, but also on the other hand is uh, sometimes people say, oh, if it works, why fix it? Uh, fix it to become more efficient, <laughs> to become more creative, to become more effective. And uh, so even if things work out well, there's, there's something more that can be done more effectively. And one of the... Um, uh, uh, tools that I like in our toolbox, it says, don't fall in love with your tactics. And you know, sometimes we often find that, yeah, we've done this tactic, it really worked, it was a big hit, we managed to, you know, um, cross some milestones, and then we come to try it again, and we're like, oh, it's not 
parking. Why? Well, because we shouldn't fall in love with our taxes. Sorry, tactics, and just keep uh, reflecting to make things more effective. Oh. Were you going to add anything? I mean, the, the big question is like mis always about mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. The big question is always about mistakes. Like, what do you do? What are they? What, how can you overcome them? Sometimes we can't help it. <laughs> it's right. true. I mean, I do think that one of the big things is not including culture, not being aware of where we are and how we're operating. Um, you know, and in the in the United States, particularly right now, we have to address oppressions and uh, biases and prejudices that actually get in the way of being able to move outside of our comfort zone or move outside of the insular communities that we work with. And it's not just in the US, it's everywhere. If we don't actually, you know, nonviolent action and beautiful trouble is successful because we have ever increasing numbers of people involved in our resistance movements. And if we don't deal with some of the oppressions and some of the, if we are, are reinforcing the problems within our current society rather than transforming them into something else, into something better that undoes racism, homophobia, sexism, ageism, and we could go on capitalism, we could go on and on and we still won't end up with a society that serves everyone. And so like this is a big mistake in the sense of like we need to do the analysis of why things worked, why people came, why they didn't come, how do we overcome some of these problems? And um, in, and that will help us with our strategy overall. Yeah. Uh, so just shifting gears a little, and um, then we'll open it up to audience questions um, after just two more questions I have. Um, so I don't know if, well, yeah, I don't know if you've followed this at all lately, um, but there's Lifetime did a documentary on R. Kelly, surviving R. Kelly for all of his, um, th the children. He, that he, um, you know, he's a predator for all the um, young women that he's abused in various different ways. And, um, you know, when I was going through, listening to the slide deck and going through the presentation even yesterday, I started to think about how do, so we want to make problems visible, invisible problems visible, but sometimes the oppressed group is invisible themselves. And so how can people in that invisible space make their, um, whatever oppression they're facing very visible. And adding on to that, um, you talked also about passive allies. And so sometimes passive allies don't always know, like they can't see this problem. So how can they get plugged into problems they know about but don't necessarily understand how to um, engage in, especially when maybe the group that needs that help can't really speak up for themselves either or not being heard? Um. Yeah, I think this is a this is like a sixty four billion dollar question, um, and uh, I think uh, there we have to in some ways. I guess there's there's a lot of different things. One is supporting the putting in place the support structures that would allow impacted communities to be able to speak out, right? And um, it's it's a it's a whole cultural context sometimes, so it's not there's nothing easy about it, um, and helping. You know, when we do workshops and trainings in education, helping people who do have privilege or who are removed from the core of the impacted communities uh, can be extraordinarily effective. Um, and then helping those folks know how to show up uh, is really, really powerful. There's lots of stories. There was, you know, some folks with, uh, particularly with the massive encampments around the Dakota Access Pipeline. There were people dedicated to, you know, ha having white people show up correctly. How do you show up correctly? Because it was a big problem, we, particularly because you were living there. But we know in urban centers, and I live in Washington, D.C., this is L.A., we know that that is a, a big problem in activist communities. How do people show up and be appropriate in where they are taking action? And taking, I mean, these are all uh, principles and theories of beautiful trouble, taking leadership from those who are most impacted, making sure that um, you yourself know the culture and know yourself and where you are in this work. And um, I think there is a piece too about reimagining who your allies could be um, and who could help you in what way. Sometimes you don't, like particularly in, uh, when we have entrenched regimes, they're, the most impactful allies are actually from out of your country in the beginning. 
uh, because you don't have good communication networks in very oppressive regimes, number one, and number two, it's too dangerous. So the expat community can mobilize um, international allies that can then serve to open up the world that you're functioning in and then can support it. So in some ways when we're talking um, about, you know, abuse scandals here in this country of particular groups, young women, young men within the church, the, there's lots of things. Like it often takes support structures being put in place or exposures happening outside of the community to empower those people to come out and to believe in a way that they will have support when they do. And then it also potentially helps other people imagine what does the, the spectrum of um, allyship look like and how they can be there. Yeah, and to address the second part of your question, building also on what Nadine said about taking leadership from the most impacted is on how to engage or plug in those passive allies. And um, really the key here is to have a clear call to action. If you're a campaign thinking, how can I most effectively get those who are passive allies to join the streets and do something, or not necessarily the streets, it could be anywhere, and uh, do something for the campaign is to have a very clear call to action. So for example, we know that we know that on Monday the teachers strike is gonna uh, you know be launched. So um, they, there's there are so many uh, possibilities that we can be involved in this strike even if we're not teachers or even parents of uh, school kids, there are so many ways to plug in. And always for campaigns to keep in mind that yeah, let's communicate uh, a number of options that can be done uh, without confusion and um, clear about why this particular action is so important to the overall strategy, I think. And this is my last question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, so another thing you touched on in the presentation um, was prefigurative intervention. And it just made me think about, we can all imagine this beautiful world that we want to live in and how perfect it could be. We just have to take the steps to get there. But then we're confronted with the world that we actually live in. And it can be depressing sometimes and make you feel like, you know, is it even worth continuing to fight for this? So could you, what kind of advice do you have for people who are fighting for a better world? And they kind of see it off in the distance, but reality is right in front of them. And it, it just makes it a lot harder. Right. Um. Well, I'll add my, my bit, and I'm sure Nadine would also have her advice, but I guess one of the first things that crossed my mind is really take care of yourself and of others in terms of emotional and mental well-being, because it can, as you say, it can be really devastating if we don't take care of ourselves and of each other, and to kind of, um, b because this passion is so strong, sometimes you end up working on something 24 hours, seven days a week, all year long and really that's not what the movement needs although that's where the passion come from, com comes from uh, the movement really needs people who are um, uh, you know who can uh, eat properly sleep properly do all these kind of you know basic w well beings that we tend to forget really so that's one number two I would say is to um, not I, for me personally, at least this was a lesson, is not to give into the romanticism of an idea or not. It's not binary and it's not, you know, um, either or. There's so always going to be something that we want to work on to improve. And uh, we're not going to get, you know, this uh, utopia that we dream of, but it's that utopia in itself is the process of getting there and achieving one success after another which takes me to the last point maybe I want to uh, say uh, about this particular point is celebrate these milestones, celebrate these successes. They really are a big deal, even if they look like such a tiny, you know, uh, drop in a big sea, they are worthy of celebration. And this celebration does really lift people's spirits and get people motivated to continue uh, in the face of this seeming darkness. Okay. 
Did you want to add anything? I mean, I, I just, I'm a broken record. I think you, I, it's, it's like building community, building connections, I think is really, really important. And then you can celebrate with those people, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and we need to train and, and we need to practice. Like we're really out of practice. It's really great to hear there's going to be a teacher strike here on Monday for a lot of reasons. I just spent, you know, you know I was on the, I was uh, flying for, uh, I went through a few different airports over the last few days, and um, I talked to every TSA agent I could talk to, and I said, you know, really, we're, we stand with you. My family, my community stands with you. It's ridiculous that you have to work without pay, and if you decide to go on strike, we'll be there with you, because they're the front lines of this particular shutdown problem, and the breakdown of our government is all about our government not caring about people, and so we need to be able to stand up for that. However, like we have a situation where uh, there needs to be community built in that uh, TSA world and other worlds so that they feel there's support there for them to step out in front and take the risk that they would need to take in order to do this. So I think it's all, it's, it's all of this, building community, getting a small group of people together to work with, having fun while you do it, um, and uh, I think doing whatever you can whenever you can do it. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the possible. Well, I think that is definitely a good note to end on. And now we'll just open an, open up the floor uh, to the audience for questions. So if you have a question, if you could just raise your hand, and the ushers will bring a microphone to you. Don't be shy, you're all <laughs> Is this, is this on? Okay. Um, what do you think about social media um, in organizing? I mean, I'm just thinking about this Saudi young girl I'm reading about who was unknown and in like two days through social media, the whole world knows about her. And um, it just seems so effective to get the word out and uh, and spread the word. So I'm just curious to know um, what you think about that. Sure. I mean, I, I guess um, for sure, this day and age with the technology gives a wide access of uh, different means of disseminating information that no longer flows from top to bottom, it's actually the opposite. And uh, we really do encourage activists to try and use all the tools they have available, including uh, social media. And in certain circumstances, like the one you're describing, in uh, oppressed, is particularly under oppressive regimes, sometimes the maximum that can be done in that particular context is a social media campaign. But at the same time, um, we. I would say we try to encourage activists to use social media as one of their many tools to amplify their campaigns because often you need also, if possible, in your context to for work to be done on the ground and supported and disseminated through social media. Um, yeah. Yep. I mean, it's important, but it doesn't actually build those bonds of community that we're talking about for the long haul or for sustainability. Yeah, if anybody wants to ask questions about any of the pictures that we showed, feel free to do that too. <laughs> Hello, uh, another. Okay, another social media kind of question. Something that's I've become aware of in the last uh, year. I uh, haven't really heard discussed. If you have comments, I'd love to hear them. It's uh, it would be found. Uh, I find it on YouTube under the heading First Amendment audit. And I don't know if you're aware of that. It's uh, it's something that it's a direct action that happens in public, and um, I think it might be uh, of interest to people who are pursuing this topic. And I don't know how widely or not it's uh, uh, been noticed. I don't know. It's it seems that uh, maybe you have not. Uh, happened onto that part of the uh, internet yet. Well, there might be something there too uh, of interest. Yeah. 
So is this is this a a First Amendment audit where somebody's keeping track of what violations are happening? It's uh, kind of like a performance art, but uh, it's a real uh, pro. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's an assertion by dem by by practice and demonstration from a public space to be aware and of uh, through documentation, through a cell phone or other somewhat more elaborate camera, simply to document. It is very um, incendiary. People uh, know on some level that uh, we're always under a camera, but we're not used to seeing each other having cameras amongst us, uh, pointing in every direction. And, the, and these people are uh, upholding and demonstrating that this is a uh, protected First Amendment uh, and an essential understanding to be extended into the uh, cultural fabric for, uh, for many uh, useful purposes. And these, um, these little interactions from three minutes to uh, half an hour or whatever that's generally unfolded like a, um, kind of uh, like a repeating play somewhat, often with uh, police that respond because people see, phone this in as uh, suspicious activity then. Uh, the interaction between the activist and the police gets very much involved with uh, who's following uh, what category of legal understanding it's almost like a game of bridge, but it's serious because people get arrested, etc. And it's just a lot of the nitty gritty of, uh, uh, or the, you know, of 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 uh, in a direct way asserting uh, uh, essential um, um, protected activities as basic as documentation. Mm -hmm. yep. So people might want to just check out First Amendment activities. First Amendment audits, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I volunteer with National Lawyers Guild, and <laughs> oh, I find that a lot of the events that they have, that they're requesting legal observers, um, take place during business hours. And my question is when a lot of movement and activism is needed during business hours, um, but I think in particular in California, but I think everywhere in this moment, um, I, I feel afraid to, to operate to protest during business hours because I'll lose my own job. Like how do we mobilize and what creative approaches do you have to make meaningful movements that are outside of business hours or that so that people don't feel constrained, so that I don't feel constrained by business hours? Yeah, this is this is good. There's a there's a lot there. So first of all, thank you for being part of the National Lawyers Guild. Thank you uh, for being a really valuable resource to our community. For people who don't know, the National Lawyers Guild is a collection of lawyers who are very progressive or liberal, depending uh, on the guild um, location, I guess, in the US. But we've found that they are often pro bono uh, attorneys for activists and very helpful in that regard. Really have appreciated working with NLG people all over the country. Um, I think one of the questions here sort of uh, is around risk. It's not just about being an NLG or a, a lawyer, but it's about how do we address the risk that's out there and how do we judge how much risk we want to take as activists or how do we ameliorate and deal with some of it. And we're in this political moment if, <laughs> that we we're talking about. Uh, we are all being called to the best of our abilities to figure out how we can up our risk level to make real change. We're in this position right now because people have not been fully engaged, I would say, in their civic and civil responsibilities. And what we need to do is figure out how to create the structures 
that will enable more of us to take greater risks. It doesn't mean that everyone has to risk the same things or the same level of things, but that each of us needs to figure out what the next level of risk is that we can take, and we need to build in our communities the support structures to help people do that. And whether it's through training to help people be more comfortable with what they might face, or whether it is building a fund to support people who are incarcerated while they're not making money so that they can, we can pay for their family to eat rather than for paying them to get out of jail, which is a whole nother conversation. These are really critical questions. And um, I will say about business hours, we need to actually disrupt business as usual. Business as usual is not being very good for very, most of us at this moment. Like where it's really, in, we, we can't just go along with what's happening right now. And so we have to figure out how we can continue to say no, build the alternatives out of the ashes while we're saying no, and support each other to take greater risks while doing it. Um, and if particular individuals cannot take greater risks, it's up to other people to figure out how to move that forward. Um, and if we aren't doing, I mean, one of my big complaints is like, we can't just have another march on a weekend. No, it, you know, it's a way that I say it, it justifies, whoa, well, everything's working fine. Like, we have a problem. Look, people have marched. Everything's fine. We have this problem. People have marched. Everything's fine. And nothing actually shifts. And so we have to disrupt what is happening So in this normal way, this, because it's not normal. It's business as usual. It's not working for the majority of the people here or across the world, and we need to be able to move past that. And some of it will be you know, personally exploring what we need to work on ourselves to overcome the risk, what we need to put in place financially, economically, emotionally, physically, and how we build community to do that. Um, and you know, we still need people who are barred, who are lawyers, and can re represent us. So we don't want all the lawyers to lose their jobs. That's not what I'm suggesting. But that um, uh, as a community and as activists, we need to be able to uh, be discerning about how we, we engage and what risks we do take. I'm also not saying that everybody should run out and you know, do something and get yourself arrested. Like, that's not necessarily strategic. <laughs> Right? So how do we you know, look at resources and the flows of, flow of resources and connections and leveraging ever greater numbers of people to make real change? No. Um, as far as marches, how effective, in particular in the United States, do you think that traditional march is? Or does it require today a higher degree of creativity, whether it's the costume or, or something? How effective is the traditional march? OK, OK, audience. Do you think it, the, how, do, how well, let me, is, are, is marching effective? At what? There we go, right? How do you know something is effective? What is the magic word? What do you need to have in order to judge whether something is effective? It begins with a G. Woohoo! We have a we have a pinch hitter. We have a goal, right? You have to have a goal. So I always talk about this, you know, in the sense of particularly in property destruction. This is a really good way to think about it. So if you're an activist and you're an activist on corporate globalization and you want to take out, you know, the World Bank or the IMF or something like that, the International Monetary Fund, and you decide that you're going to target a corporation to do this. And you go to your favorite coffee shop window and you get a brick and you throw the brick through the window. Um, was that effective at ending corporate globalization? Why not? Did it change? Because it didn't change corporate, right? Well, you did, maybe you broke the window, right? If you went out there and you got, if you got a brick and you went out there and you threw the brick through a window and the window broke, were you effective? If you wanted to break the window, you were effective. Yeah, that was really good. But other than that, you didn't bring down the corporate industrial complex by breaking a window, right? Um, unless your goal was to break the window, you weren't effective. But on the other hand, if you have a march and your goal is to show people that there is a growing resistance movement, that there are thousands or millions of people who care about this issue, and, you sh and the thousands or millions of people show up, were you effective? 
Yeah, totally. But if your goal was to be like uh, stage a coup or bring down the government and all these people showed up, but the government didn't come down because that, and that was your goal, were you effective? No. And we are in a position right now in our country where uh, we, the normal operating procedures are not necessarily working in a timeline that's appropriate, that's, a, that's actually okay. Like too many people are hurting and being hurt on the border, in our communities, whether we're talking about immigration policies, gun control policies, uh, you know, sexual violence. Can, you know, we, we are in, not in a position right now where simply marching will deliver what we need at the timeline we need it. It's not that you shouldn't march, right? It, we might need to march because we might need to build the knowledge. We might need to make sure that people know and meet each other to build community. As long as we know what the goals are for marching, it can deliver on those goals. But if we say we're going to hold a march and it's going to bring down the government, it's not working right now in the regime that we have. Does anyone else? Oh, looks like we have a question there. Um, there was someone who spoke here about a year ago. He wrote a book called Rise Up with his father. I forgot his name. But they talked about what happened in a, uh, I forgot the country, but uh, everything was organized. They brought down the government, and there's a film made about it. Um, and they had a lot of training that was involved. And I asked them if they had an app, and they said no. And I feel that right now we're all kind of trained. Training is kind of a turnoff. If there's an app, you can mobilize people to go get trained. But if you're if Beautiful Trouble, my question is, does Beautiful Trouble have an app? And if not, why not? Because I think an app is the quickest, easiest way to get people aware of things, to train them. Uh, and again, people lead very busy lives these days. They're doing many things. To go somewhere and train, they're already familiar with civil rights and all these things. If you can just create an app and put it on someone's phone, I think that's the most effective way to get people up and doing things and directed and uh, engaged, and so I guess my question is, um, does Beautiful Trouble have an app? And if not, why not? You mean a training app? You mean an app for training? What, an app what, for uh, activism. Uh, like, uh, you know, just an app. If it's, I feel if it's not an app these days, it's not going to be effective. Because everybody is using apps, especially young people. And if Beautiful Trouble has an app, it's like, oh cool, an app. Oh, there's a session over here, a talk, a this, a that. That's the first step. And if you're not doing anything without an app, I feel it's not going to work. Well, I mean, there, there's all kinds of online training. I'm not, I mean, we, we could talk more about what kind of app would we want. So we have a chat bot, for example. Yeah, no, we have, we have something you can use on your phone to download this stuff and to read about it. So it's basically, I guess, uh, what you're trying to say is not only to make it accessible by phone, like mobile view, but actually to have, uh, to go to the app store and download it right uh, off your, yeah. No, that's a, For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a that's a cool idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this, I mean, what you're talking about is an active calendar even, right? So somebody says, I have a few hours I can do, do X. And, and that can be really useful. There's a really wonderful story. I don't know if you're talking about, I don't know which country you're talking about, but there's a great example from Serbia uh, where Atpor, which means enough, was... There is a film about it, yeah. Great, a great movie about this. Um, and one of the things, they used this thing, it was a multi-level marketing scheme, basically, where they would use friends to recruit other friends, and then they would get in and do, they would actually do a training, but they found the biggest resistance was that people didn't want to go to a, meet, a meeting 
um, as novices. And so it was really important. They did these trainings that got people into the streets, and every cohort did an action before they went to an actual meeting so that they were not novices when they went to the meeting. And they did this research, and they figured this out. And so um, they have, uh, you know, a, that, that was their whole theory about how they grew their movement. But they had an extreme amount of training involved. Um, but it clustered it, and it grew that way. So it's a really great story. I, yeah, I mean, I guess each one does serve uh, a great purpose, and I don't think they're mutually exclusive. In fact, each uh, each program will have its uh, particular target audience and deliver certain, uh, let's say, outcomes or deliverables that you want to get out of. Uh, so I guess, like, I think the training is definitely important for those who are seeking that particular kind of skill and tool, and also the app is really important for those who are looking for an alternative. So yeah. Are there any activist apps at all? Uh, this is a good question. I, I One thing I wanted to mention as an example, actually, I remember people from the Obama campaign uh, having an app for the ca specifically for uh, canvassing as a tactic, and it was easier to plug in all these, uh, who I think they ended up being I don't know how many millions of volunteers who participated in that campaign. And very interestingly, it was pulled in together through a canvassing app designed specifically for that campaign. So I think, yeah, it is possible. And yeah. And so two people have mics now. So if both of you could ask your questions, um, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with these last two questions. Cool. Um, so just as like actually a follow up to that, um, as a young person, I think not only is the 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 idea of like a training a turn off, but also the idea of downloading an app even seems like a bit of work. But do you have like I, I mean yeah, we're lazy I guess, but do you have like some sort of like group messaging system? Like cause cause with an app too, they would have to be developing it and they would have to work out the bugs for it and you would need a lot of people yeah, it would take a really long time to develop a functional app. There are a few frameworks that people have taken advantage of in the past. So do you, I guess my question would be like, do you guys organize through any sort of established frameworks? Like I know Slack is a pretty popular one or um, any sort of other group messaging or do you just do things through your website? Uh, internally or externally? I guess when you're, when you're trying to organize, like do you, so, so for example, do you have like a framework for, for what he's talking about with like, Hey, I'm angry about this. Is there something going on in my area? Like, what can I do about it? Yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about? Yeah. Can we just add the other, add the other last question in, and then answer both of them together? Sure. Yeah. I guess my question's on a different, a little bit it's higher level. It's okay. Uh, so you're called Beautiful Trouble, and I think one of the things that attracted me and brought me in today is that you obviously have an insight that communication is really important, whether that's visual communication, whether that's some kind of call to action, and like the, the kind of creative idea behind that call to action or that piece of communication, getting people excited about or aware or you know of the issue at hand and, and ready to do something. And it just seems like you guys, that's something that's a little bit unique about your approach. And I wanted to hear from you about how important you think that is and how you came to that as kind of part of your your approach and strategy. Uh, uh, well, okay, we'll we'll hit maybe both of these things. So first of all, um, one of the challenges for this app or framework is that the work tends to be very localized, it, particularly in the United States. We're huge, so it's hard to. Um, I know that there's different communities that have different alert systems, and the old school was just an email list or a, a phone calling tree, right? And so we have had those things very effectively used in different communities on different scales on really different issues over a long period of time. So there still is room for, for doing what would be updated now, I think. And uh, the challenge would be the, the scale and the mobilization potential in different communities and how people are used to responding. Um, you know, like for a long time in Washington, D.C., if anything happened, 
whether we started bombing another country or they did something in the schools or who knows what it was, we would just go to the White House at five o'clock or as soon as you could get off work. Like everybody just knew to go there. And there was a you know, whole community email listserv and stuff. All that stuff actually is uh, not the same anymore, right? There's really a lot of different things that happens. The national groups put out a call to do something in different places. The localized groups say, no, do something else. So there is a potential for doing more of that. I do think the challenge is how do we, I mean, in smaller countries like Serbia or other places, there was a way to or localize the response that made sense on their national level, level. but here the national call-outs and the local call-outs would be really, really different, potentially. So it's something to think about. Um, and uh, there are also ways that we've talked about, and some of us do use bots to answer the most common questions, for example, that come into organizations about what to do or how to go places. So that is also being used, I think, somewhat effectively, depending. And then there are other resources um, there are all kinds of action networks and um, listings of places to go to look for activity. So if you're a member of you know, a big, one of the big national groups, uh, whether it's Move On or Planned Parenthood or NARAL, you could go someplace and find out if there's something planned. But unless you opt in to get something sent to your email or your phone number, you won't get that otherwise, which is an interesting thing. So there's lots of things to play with. I, I appreciate the tech thinking about it. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll let you say something. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to um, uh, to comment on a few things on how really crucial it is for social movements to revolutionize the way that they organize, and that definitely includes uh, technology as part of it. But also, I feel at the same time, it's important to realize for us in individually and collectively if there's something that we really care there are so many issues out there right and sometimes you feel like oh my god i care about the environment i care about the housing issue i care about all these issues and we really can't invest all on our energy in every single issue right and that's where this technology comes in that you can plug in uh, and do your bit on all the on like these uh, great number of issues but there i feel that there are some issues that call upon their own constituencies to be fully out there, not only through an app, not through messaging, not through um, only social media, but to actually go out there and to to do something with other people. And uh, yeah, there's a, there's a tricky line to be drawn between our use of technology and how to maximize our uh, efficacy in, uh, in using it, but at the same time, how much effort we put in in bringing the communities closer and build and really doing uh, movement building work that on the long run uh, will pay off all that hard work instead of just you know um, plugging in where people can I don't know if that makes sense but kind of just the balance between the convenience and Yeah. I, I fully agree with you. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. But if there weren't, what I mean, what if there weren't enough people out there to care about this issue, this app is not going to show up, right? Yeah. 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 We'll continue. And. Yeah, there was this other thing uh, I wanted to mention, and it kind of links also to the question that um, you asked, sorry, I, I didn't catch your name, uh, about like how um, the business as usual hours, and this, is, this comes in also interestingly with technology, is how to make tactics uh, scalable. And sometimes the thing about marches is that they're tied to a particular physical place, but the really key things about the most impactful and successful tactics is the ones that can grow to scale and the ones that can be done from all the very different locations uh, that people can engage in, like, for example, the Taco Bell boycott or, for example, the Palestinian-led BDS movement for uh, boycott or uh, phone banking or all these other tactics that can really uh, um, grow to scale 
and not limit people into one geographical location. And yeah, I think there would be an interesting interplay between all the different questions that are coming up. Yeah, and I, and I mean about the creativity piece. I'm 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 not sure if I got the question exactly right, but in the stories that we uh, draw inspiration from, in Beautiful Trouble and in Beautiful Rising, and Beautiful Rising is stories mostly from the global south. Um, so really powerful stories from a lot of places where civil society is much more constrained than here. Although we're close. We're, we're closely getting to that place where regime, where regime is really hampering our ability to do things. Um, is, you know, to think about all of these creative stories. So uh, we find that, um, you know, resistance movement in um, Brazil where the government wanted to shut down a couple hundred schools and bus people to smaller, to schooling, to, to shut down schools to save money to, you know, make smaller, uh, bigger schools and in, in, uh, but a lot fewer schools cause the students to basically say no this isn't going to be okay and they shut the schools down and then put in place the schooling that they wanted and of course the allies that came into this work the teachers and the transportation workers who were impacted by this and who said well the transportation is not working either and so that the whole growth of how the framing of the resistance was um, and they didn't necessarily use this word, but intersectional and understanding everything that was impacted helped uh, establish more creative responses and a whole more holistic, if you will, response to the trouble, uh, to the problems that were facing them and a really uh, effective way of making change. So they set up these alternative, as we said, they're putting in place the future that they want. They, they occupied the schools for more than two months the government actually caved in and reconfigured their proposal. And this actual um, uh, tactic was repeated in many other locations in other countries. So it was a scalable thing. So it wasn't just a shutdown of the school, an occupation of the school, but an occupation to provide the kind of training that they wanted and education that they wanted and a, a, a community effort to make sure that all of the pieces associated with that, whether it was transportation, food, et cetera, went along and made it happen. So um, in the call to action, you know, or the, the framing of the work that they were doing, um, all of that was considered and, and built out. And there's lots of great, that's how come we can learn so much from these stories is because um, the background of how different communities and different activists have integrated these pieces then can give us inspiration for what we do here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that is going to wrap up our discussion. If we could get a, give another round of goodness, applause uh, to Nadine and Juman for um, sharing all of their resources with us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming.